Now, apart from Soma's symbolic associations with celestial herbs, the second most frequently cited god in the Rig Veda embodies yet another source of spiritual energy and light. But that would be the cosmic element of fire, Agni. The Sanskrit name for this god, Agni, means literally fire or flames. And clearly relates etymologically to its cognate in Latin, ignis, agni, ignis, or in its English usage in the words ignite and igneous. Fire altars played a critical role in the performance of a soma sacrifice because Aryan priests would conventionally toss ladles of the soma juice and sometimes ghee or drawn butter into a hearth as part of the drinking ritual. These portions of butter and soma juice representing their generous contribution of the sacrament to the gods and especially to the god of fire, Agni. And to be sure, we find evidence of fire altars in early archaeological sites of the Persian and the Indian Aryans. In Iran, the use of fire altars among Aryan tribes and civilizations accompanied their practice of a Homa sacrifice. Not Soma, but obviously the same plant. And we shall delve into those matters in our episode on Zoroastrianism. We also find the use of fire altars among Buddhist communities in Pakistan during the Gandharvan period, around 2,000 years ago, during which age the ritual flames would have still, no doubt, been associated with Vedic Agni. But Agni as a god represents much more than fire in Vedic verses and rituals. Because Agni also manifested himself in the rising and setting of a warming sun, in which case he seems to play a secondary role as a sun god. Or even more often, Agni's spiritual flames, known as tapas or tejas, are described as a fervor that emanates from aquatic plants that thrive in lakes and streams. The ruddy flames of Agni are said to lick the udder of Soma plants when he accompanies the plant god in Soma sacrifices. And note here how the altar is built in the form of a well-known aquatic plant, the sacred lotus. In the earliest hymns of the Vedic corpus, Agni is entitled the bearer of offerings during the Soma sacrifice which seemingly implies that he bore the sacrificial victim, the soma plant, along with the soma drink, portions of which are sacrificed into the fire. When ladles of the juices were thrown into the fire, Agni combusted. The very first verse of the Rig Veda's first hymn addresses Agni, specifically as the chief priest of the Vedic pantheon, announcing Om Agni, the chosen priest, God and minister of the sacrifice. However, Agni assumes other roles and curious characteristics in Vedic mythology. Much as Soma Pavamana, Agni experiences rebirth on a daily basis his appearance being described as an awakening to the dawning of the sun. Agni is Ushar Bud. Ushar meaning, Ushas meaning the dawn, and Bud meaning to awaken. Yet strangely, this fire god awakens from the waters and is born from plants. Or in the refrains of the Rig Veda, Agni 
This is the fire. Your home is in the floods. Into the plants you make your way. And as their child of the plants, you are born anew, worshipped with offerings, shines your flame, O Agni, from the sacred oil, with kisses on this Soma ladle's mouth. So apart from representing flames, Agni also shares with Soma, paradoxically, the title of Apam Napat child of the waters, which is a very strange birthplace for a fire, wouldn't you say? And that would be a fire that rises among aquatic plants, or to be more specific, from lotus plants, according to the Yajurveda. You, Agni, are the back, that would be the surface, of the wide, expansive waters about to bear Agni, least to be laid aside, growing to might as the lotus flower, do you extend in width with the measure of heaven? That role of measuring the vastness of the heavens is a role that Agni's spiritual flames shares with the flames of Soma Pavamana. This concept of a combustive lotus plant is somewhat strange in itself, for who would actually waste their time attempting to build fires with weak and hollow, insubstantial lotus stalks? And how is it possible for fire to ignite upon the surface that would be the back of expansive waters, the cosmic ocean, a mythic theme? As strange as these mythic images seem, the concept was a popular theme in the early arts of the Buddhist center known as Amaravati. There, a flaming lotus pillar is surrounded by plump Gandharva figures, these being a class of underworld spirits uh, with which Soma is identified specifically on occasions in the Vedas. That these motifs show up at early Buddhist sites should not be construed as belonging to a different tradition because early Buddhist communities actually worshipped the Vedic pantheon. And the connection is entirely consistent with Vedic verses that remind us constantly how Soma, like a sun, burns with the spiritual fervor of Agni, which Sanskrit speakers refer to as either tejas, or tapas. And conversely, not unlike Soma, Agni, the god of fire, is also described as having or being a skambha, a cosmic pillar, which seems to me, once again, like a strange way to describe flames in a fire altar. A pillar? Hmm... I can't see it. And Agni is also described as a flying sacrificial arrow, flaming arrow, a motif that, as we have seen, applies equally to Soma, which we have just equated with ascendant budding lotus stalks when they begin to reach skyward. Now, as Soma stalks ascend to the heavens, they're often said to swell in Vedic refrains by using the Sanskrit verb ashva, to swell. To wit, from the white Yajurveda, may your every shoot, O God, swell. The Yajurveda also applies the same term ashva to Agni when he swells on a daily basis. Now, descriptions of the fiery skamba of Agni is only slightly distinguished from the skamba of Soma by their emphasis on the pillar's ruddy refulgence produced by flames. So if you compare and contrast the attributes of Agni and Soma, 
there are actually very few differences between these gods. Thus, many Sanskritists, especially the early translators, have acknowledged the apparent mutual identities of Soma Pavamana and Agni in the Vedas, which is consistent with Agni's mythic role as a flaming arrow or cosmic archer during Soma's sacrifices. Because Agni in the Rig Veda strikes with terror like a shaft shot forth, like an archer's arrow tipped with flame. One shouldn't be surprised then to find that two hymns in the Rig Veda are dedicated to a god known as Agni Soma, as though the two gods were one and the same thing, one and the same divine type. These hymns seem to verify a statement in the White Yajur Veda, which, which states forthrightly that Agni is Soma. That is correct. The verse says, Agni, fire, is Soma. And since the plant of Agni's choosing in both the Rig Veda and Yajur Veda is the sacred lotus, simple logic requires that we recognize the lotus as Soma as well. One passage of the white Yajur Veda states, Waxing to greatness, resting on the lotus, may you, Agni, spread in amplitude with heaven's own measure. Agni, Atarvan, the priest, brought you forth by pressing you from the lotus. Or in the dark Yajur Veda, growing to might as the lotus flower, how you, Agni, extend in width with the measure of heaven. Atarvan first pressed you out, O Agni, you, O Agni, from the lotus, Atarvan, pressed you out. But how does a priest press out fire from an aquatic plant stem? So there it is, straight up, Agni is pressed out of the lotus as though he was Soma. So no wonder then that personified portrayals of Agni have flames that issue from either the god's head or his shoulders in classical iconography, Yet at the same time, they have him sitting on lotus flowers or carrying soma vessels, the Vedic kailasha, etched here with lotus petals. As time would have it, Agni's flaming lotus blossoms would be inherited by other latecomers to the Aryan Indo-Aryan pantheon. Two obvious heirs being the Hindu god Shiva in classical mythology and the Buddhist, so-called god of gods, the Buddha. In fact, Shiva, the Hindu god of death, often goes by the name of Rudra. And Rudra in a, is a prehistoric Vedic god with very close associations to Soma. In fact, one hymn is, dis is dedicated to Rudra Soma. And the iconic image of Shiva Rudra has him dancing upon a flaming lotus blossom in the same vein that the Buddha enters into the trance of nirvana as he sits on a flaming lotus flower. Note how both of these gods are associated with the same blossoms and, and how they shine in the spiritual flames, the tejas and tapas of the so-called seat of the ancients. The transference of Agni and Soma's divine energies to other Aryan gods in later periods is a fun and intriguing subject, but they will require a lot more attention when we take up those matters in our episodes that cover Hinduism and Buddhism. So at this point, we are beginning to detect an emerging pattern in early Aryan symbolism, a pattern that relates to the habit of conferring the attributes of one god onto another. Surya is no more sun-like than Soma. Agni is no less pyrogenic than Soma, 
while Chandra and Soma share the same moonlight qualities. So we're beginning to get the hang of Vedic symbolism. And if my novel interpretations of Vedic verses in terms of Soma's botanical identity actually hold water, then we should expect at this point to find yet other members of the Vedic pantheon to share their traits with the sacred lotus in a reciprocal manner. And in fact, the three-pronged symbol that supports the Buddha's lotus throne in this image here, this Buddha being Amitabha of the Far East, his name meaning immeasurable light, represents another form of cosmic energy that traces to somic themes in the prehistoric Vedas. The double-ended trident you see here is symbolic of a lightning bolt in Aryan tradition, a weapon of the most popular god in the Rig Vedic hymns, the storm god known as Indra, one of several so-called father of the sky gods. Indra's principal weapon is a golden vajra, the thunderbolt, which he employs incessantly to extract soma from wily serpents that lay at the bottom of lakes and rivers at the Punjab. Note here, to begin with, that the three-pronged tips of Indra's weapon of choice are symbolic of rays of light, rays that are emitted from two lotus flowers that stand back to back. This is one of several standard symbolic forms of the Vajra in both Brahmanic and Buddhist iconography. Like many Vedic gods, Indra exhibits the characteristics of several celestial elements of the Aryan cosmos, primarily his lethal lightning bolts, which he wields on occasions as a sun god. Of the 1,028 hymns that comprise the Rig Veda, the oldest of the Vedas, over 250 hymns are dedicated exclusively to Indra, more than any other god in the Indo-Aryan pantheon, in including Sama, in this text. And most of these hymns celebrate Indra's insatiable fondness for the nectar of the god Samrita. So what pertains to Indra in Vedic mythology pertains equally by association to Soma, the drink or the god. Interestingly, Indra's Vajra is occasionally identified as the Soma plant itself in Vedic verses. Or so it seems if we take these verses seriously and literally. In hymns dedicated to Soma Pavamana, we hear, for example, as Indra's thunderbolt, Soma is flowing on to make the heart rejoice. Or, more beauteous than the beautiful, as Indra's bolt, this Soma, rich in sweets, clamoring in the vats. And not unlike the Veda's vegetated sun and moon, this bolt does not strike from the sky, but rather it rises directly from an aquatic abyss of the Punjab. As one hymn notes, deep in the cosmic ocean lies the bolt with waters compassed round about. And in continuous onward flow, the floods their tribute bring to it. So this bolt rests under floodwaters. In a similarly worded passage of the Atharva Veda, a now familiar constellation of standard metaphors sing praise to the glorious nature of, quote unquote, lightning's flower. Says the verse, Thou art the babe of the Sindhu River, Soma. Thou art lightning's flower. Wind, breath, and sun, thou art the eye and milk of heaven. So no wonder 
The Vajra has been so intimately attached to lotus blossoms throughout Indian history. The trident bolt of Shiva in classical iconography is wielded as a flower in the hands of Hinduism's famous god of destruction among the ninth century temples of Prambanan in Indonesia. Or among the Cambodian ruins at Bante Sre, the bolts of Indra are lotus flowers, a recurrent theme that clearly extends from the early Vedic formula, Vajra equals Soma. This portrayal of the blossoms also complements the explicit description of Indra's bolt in the Rig Veda as Tri Kakub, meaning that Indra's Vajra bolt is three-pointed or three-pronged. The numerous hymns to Indra in the Rig Veda provide sufficient detail to allow for at least a partial reconstruction of this god's mythical life. Even though Sanskritists emphasize Indra's role as a storm god, a theme that was clearly appreciated by Shiva worshippers at Bhante Sre in Cambodia, as you see here. Much older Vedic hymns mostly emphasize Indra's constant thirst for and pursuit of the elixir of immortality. Indra thrives on Amrita. The storm god seeks out Soma Sap to fulfill his primary function in Vedic mythology, which is to procure sufficient quantities of the nectar of immortality in order to distribute it among all the sky gods in the heavens. And he must accomplish this feat by first dispossessing Soma's essence from a swarm of dark and wily adversarial serpents that live and creep in the underworld of the Punjab's rivers and lakes. With well-placed strikes from his Vajra, Indra expropriates the dragon fiends of their underworld treasures, and that would be Soma. As observed on this stone panel at Bhante Sre, Indra hurls his Vajra from a three-headed elephant toward a three-headed serpent that emerges from a lake filled with geese. This serpent is none other than the three-headed dragon of Vedic renown, Vishvarupa, whose body is filled, as you can see here, with lotus flowers. In Vedic mythology, Indra must either drink Soma to gain needed strength to vanquish the dragons of the deep, or otherwise he must vanquish the serpents to strengthen himself with his booty, and that would be the immortalizing nectar of the gods. So the Soma drink can be framed in mythical terms as either a cause or an effect of Indra's um, militant prowess. Collectively, Indra's adversaries comprise a host of earthbound snakes, dragons, so to say, that go by a variety of generic titles, such as Druj, meaning demon or deceiver. Uh, they go by the name of Ahis, meaning snakes, or Ashuras, implying spirits of the earth, or more often than not, they're referred to as Vritras, meaning literally pervaders, as in pervaders of their aquatic underworld. The leader of the Vritras, the most famous of and more or less chief of them, is known singularly as Vritra, pervader. In opposition to these underworld spirits, we have a class of sky gods known as the Devas, and they are battling constantly the Asuras, the earth demons. Many devas share cooperative roles with Indra as Vritrahans, that is, dragon slayers, Hans referring to slaying the Vritra. The aquatic snakes are in constant conflict with the sky gods because they hoard and refuse to share the elixir of immortality both in Vedic as well as post-Vedic scriptures. 
Indra must therefore rob or dispossess Vritra and his buddies of their Amrita on a seasonal basis. And to do so, he must ascend the Aryan heavens with a solar body during the autumnal month of each year, from which station he hurls his Vatra into the creeping bodies, or sometimes they say into the jaws of these dark and truculent challengers. A well-thrown bolt helps to secure the immortalization of the sky gods. On another relief from Bhante Sre, seen here, Indra mounts the head of a dragon with his Vajra, poised to actually strike the same creature. And we observe not one, but two extended serpents slipping out of the large dragon mouth and out of the dragon's ancient skin. His body, destined to release a train of lotus blossoms in a maelstrom of fire and, and what appears to be fluxions of water. The physical and mythical features of Vedic Indra match closely then with those of Soma Pavamana, the plant god, because they both, after all, are solar-bodied Vritrahans, dra dragon slayers. Two hymns of the Rig Veda are addressed, in fact, to a god by the name of Indra Soma, as though, once again, these gods represent the coessence of one another. Or other hymns dedicated to Soma, Pavamana, simply state the case as such. Indra's self is Pavamana, yea, the bull, and the bright, the beloved thunderbolt, girt with brightness, Indra revealed, reveals the Soma juice, pressed out by tiny stones. The slaying of Ritra allows for the distribution of Amrita among all 33 of the Devas, the shining gods of heaven, which would include Soma and Agni, who beseech their father Indra in one tale of the Yajurvedas, the dark Yajurvedas second chapter. They beseech him to assist them in their own immortalization. The paired gods request Indra to, and I quote, bear the offering of Soma to us, for we too have lost our brilliance. Our brilliance is in Vritra. This passage implies that the bodies of riverine dragons withhold the divine energies of Soma and Agni. The following verses in the same hymn provide a mythic detail on Indra's crucial role here when the storm god offers Soma an explanation as to why he vanquishes serpent demons. As he responds, Now that I have slain Vritra, my power and strength have gone into the earth, so the plants and roots have now been born. This presumably implies that the plants emerge from their roots when Indra's bolt is heard into the jaws of dark rivering creepers. A fully personified impression of Indra among the 10th century Jain temples at Kajuraho in India portrays Indra with a lotiformed vajra that has impaled, once again, the proverbial three-headed serpent. When Vedic Indra robs the three-headed dragon of his serpent magic, known as Maya, not only for himself, but for the benefit of Aryan priests, he simultaneously incites soma shoots to emerge from the depths of waters. So the bolt is clearly symbolic of the plant's appearance in the celestial realms of the devas. So now that we have covered various ways in which soma, the plant, relates symbolically to various inanimate objects of nature, which is to say, the sun and moon, fire and lightning. We can now turn our attention to a number of animal symbols in the Vedas that represent the sacred plant, each in its own unique way. And since we are coming off the topic of Indra, let's begin with the dark serpents of the Punjab, 
a symbolic source of Soma's lustrous pillars. <laughs> 